Good evening, everybody. Good evening to the candidates. Uh, we have one chance to meet. I'm Greg Pettis. Uh, the president of the state, Marjorie, is somewhere. He is the minister of the Presbyterian Church, and I think they have said that he learned something. I don't know. So he's the only one this tonight. But I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the candidates for being here uh, and our moderator. Uh, this is probably the most important issue that we're going to be facing, uh, not just in Coachella Valley, but in California for decades to come. That's uh, water. And what all does that mean to us? Hopefully, we're going to find that out. The first uh, question that we ask every week at, at Rotary when we go through our, our four way test is is it the truth? And we're going to be holding our candidates to that as well tonight. We want to know exactly what's happening both with the agency and with water in the valley. And we want to know exactly what the truth is and what we have to look forward to and what we should do. I'm going to turn it over to the moderator. Uh, we get to see him five nights a week uh, on, I think, the best television station. <laughs> TV station in the desert too, <laughs> KSQ News Channel 3. Um, thank you much, uh, Greg, and also Cathedral City Evening Rotary Club for inviting us to take part in this. It is this huge issue in all of California and certainly here in the Coachella Valley right now. And uh, you all get gold stars for being the few in town who uh, come out and, and uh, exercise your community involvement to uh, hear what the candidates have to say. Uh, the candidates are here, and the good news for them is that two out of three of them will win in November. And the bad news is one of you won't. <laughs> um, let's meet them real quick. On the far end, we have uh, Craig Ewing, who is uh, currently uh, the incumbent uh, president of the uh, Board of Directors for Desert Water Agency. In the middle, we have uh, Kristen Bloomer, who is uh, the challenger, financial consultant in town, and mom. And also on the far end here, we have Richard Oberhaus, who is uh, an appointed incumbent to uh, Desert Water Agency. So thank you all for being with us. It's a real simple uh, format uh, from what Greg gave me. Everyone has a couple of minutes to uh, just kind of tell us why you want to be uh, elected in November. And then we'll ask some questions, and then we'll give you all a minute at the end to uh, summarize everything you said over the previous hour or so. So with that in mind, uh, we didn't draw straws or anything. Why don't we let the challenger, Kristen Blimmer, go first, and uh, ladies first. And uh, go ahead and uh, take a couple of minutes. Uh, we don't have formal timekeeping. This is a pretty informal uh, forum tonight. Um, but I'll give you a high sign if it's going a little bit too long. Can I get to 10 minutes or something? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Kristen Bloomer and I'm a resident of Palm Springs. I also grew up in Palm Springs and uh, graduated from Palm Springs High School. I have a degree in economics from Boston University and a professional background in financial planning. I've also been very active in the community ever since I was in junior high with National Charity League to I'm currently the PTA president at my son's school, St. Teresa. I'm also um, a current member and past president of the Palm Springs Sun Up Rotary Club, so I'm happy to see all my fellow Rotarians here tonight. And I am the current vice chair of the Measure J Oversight Commission at the city of Palm Springs. So I hope to continue to serve the community by being elected on November 3rd um, as a Desert Water Agency board member. I want to make sure that we have affordable and a plentiful water supply here in the um, Desert Water Agency District. And part of that is ensuring that um, 
the uh, shovel ready projects up at the state water project are um, started and completed to ensure that we have that continuous water supply to replenish our aquifer here and that takes very strong and uh, new leadership to represent desert water agency up in sacramento also um, i will uh, ensure to reach out to the communities in the desert water agency boundaries to all the ratepayers in desert hot springs cathedral city and palm springs um, and uh, open up lines of communication with the different agencies and groups, such as the city government, the Agua um, Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians, just to ensure that we're all on the same page and that we can all work together to preserve our most precious resource here, which is water, which is needed for everything and everybody, including continued economic development, jobs and the livelihood of every person living here and visiting the Coachella Valley. So I hope that you will elect me for new leadership on the Desert Water Agency Board November 3rd. Thanks. Thank you. Richard Overhaus. Good evening and, and thank you to the Rotarians for coming and hosting this, Greg and yourself. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I moved to the desert 26 years ago and one of the first phone calls that I made was to set up um, accounts, electric, water, etc. Coming from uh, the foggy side of San Francisco, I moved here for sunshine and a swimming pool. And when I called the water agency and inquired about water restrictions, they said there were none. That was my education on day number one when it came to water. Uh, living in the desert, I, I found it astounding that uh, water was so plentiful here. So that started my learning experience in water. We are blessed with an aquifer. Uh, the agency was founded because way back in the 40s, it was being overtapped. And we now recharge it through the, the, the exchange with Met, with Colorado River water. Uh, there's no question that uh, water is vital to the community, the success of the desert, business, and livelihood. But we need to do something to be more sustainable and reduce our water footprint so that generations ahead of us have an opportunity to live the quality of life that we do. In the two years that I've been on the board, uh, I've promoted just that agenda. Uh, conservation has been number one on my mind. It was an interesting time to be appointed to the board in the midst of a 500-year drought and uh, some legal issues. There has never been a dull moment. And I've taken uh, great interest in the issue, uh, bring my experience and background to it, and I hope that on November 3rd, you'll re-elect me to the post. Thank you much, Craig Ewing. Thank you, John, and thank you to the Rotarians for hosting this and for all of you being here tonight. Uh, my name is Craig Ewing. I was elected to the Board of Directors of the Desert Water Agency in 2007 and was re-elected in 2011 as the top vote getter. And I'm running for a third term because I think it's important that we uh, provide a transitional uh, time with stable leadership on the board of directors as the Desert Water Agency moves from a quiet supplier of water that sort of left you alone and they, they like that you left them alone uh, into a new era of cooperation with the public on water conservation and demand management. And this is a big change, a cultural change for the agency uh, and for water agencies up and down the state to be more engaged with the public than they, they've, they've ever been before. I have 28 years experience in local government as a city planner, and I retired in 2013 after seven and a half years of planning, uh, as a planning director of the city of Palm Springs. So I have a good feeling for local government and the issues that people bring and expect to have resolved by uh, public service at the local level, uh, and found that in all those years as a planner, water was never an issue in the land use business. We talked about traffic and design and all kinds of things, and water was never a problem. It was just there. Well, that's changed, and we need to now meld a lot of issues together. Land use planning and the availability of water are linked to get today in ways they never have been, and I've been interested in how we move forward with uh, water, land use, conservation, and the partnership between the Desert Water Agency and our customers. Uh, 
During the last few years, I have also served on the board of directors of the Association of California Water Agencies, which is an umbrella organization for the water agencies up and down the state. And I've seen many of the ways that people are conserving, look, looking at best practices, and also looking at the various issues surrounding groundwater management up and down the state. So I bring a wealth of experience and would look for the support of the community for a third term on the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now we'll start some questions. And uh, these have been prepared. Uh, well, Greg sent them to me, so I assume the Rotary uh, prepared them. Also, we have some questions from the audience. The first one, I'm going to combine two questions together. <laughs> and uh, we'll start with Craig and then uh, go right across. Uh, so everyone will get a chance to answer, uh, chime in on these. Um, and that is, uh, what would you do to increase customer involvement in district policy making? And to that end, one of our audience members asked, the board meets at 8 in the morning. How is this transparent? Go ahead, Craig. Thank you. We've talked about uh, alternative times for meetings. And uh, one of the challenges that we have is that to meet in the evenings requires additional expense for staff overtime and that sort of thing. And we run a pretty lean agency. We've also uh, looked at the experience of the Coachella Valley Water District that met at alternative times in the evenings, and they found that their attendance didn't change significantly. So we have, we believe, some background to suggest that our 8 a.m. meetings uh, are uh, efficient and available to, to people. But I think community involvement is another question. And uh, there's a, a number of things that we have done and can do to improve our relations with the community through meetings with HOAs on water budget planning, to work with uh, schools, and we have a, an educational program in the sixth grade throughout the school district on water conservation. And the workshops that we've had on uh, uh, turf buyback, training our landscapers on how to properly irrigate, these are more directed topical outreach efforts, and they've been pretty successful. And finally, we had a number of workshops when we looked at our last rate increase program. And uh, that kind of specific topical outreach, I think, is more successful than uh, a general sort of keep the doors open at a convenient hour. Uh, we've made a strong effort to reach out to people on the issues that are of concern to them, and that's where our best efforts have come in. Krista Blumer. Um, I also agree that I think that um, meeting day and time uh, we get the same number of people in public comment and public input um, our measure j commission meets at four o'clock in the afternoon and just depending on the subject that we're discussing it that's what really um, gets people out to speak in public comment so i think notifying uh, you know customers and ratepayers and uh, the community of what is on the agenda and i know all the agendas are online it's those certain topics that will bring out the people. I know the entire uh, room was packed, standing room only, and people spilling out to the outside when the conservation uh, ordinance was being discussed. So I know that Desert Water Agency did let everybody know and get input from the community. And I have realized um, in my experience on the city commission is if you ask the community and provide a way for them to get you the information, they will give it to you. And everyone has an opinion, and as long as you notify everyone of the different ways they can communicate with the Desert Water Agency, I think you can create a good, re good working relationship with the community and really find out um, what they need. And as a board member, I would make myself available to the community members um, to reach out to with questions or concerns or or input. Richard Oberhaus? I think consistency on our meeting time and uh, place really does work. Um, the Coachella Valley Water District is a much bigger district spanning many more miles. We, we cover 325 square miles. Our headquarters is centrally located in the district. 8 a.m. meetings might be hard to wake up and appear at, but they also don't interfere with the work schedule. And I gotta remind you, being on, on a board like the Water Board, it's public service. So um, not all of us are retired, and having those meetings at 8 a.m. make it possible to have a daytime job as well. 
Um, we have done a great deal of outreach. Uh, Craig mentioned the workshops. Uh, two years ago, we sponsored a workshop at the convention center that was well attended. Um, got a lot of feedback from people about what was important to them. We took those lessons to heart. That's how the turf buyback program started and had a real conversation about tiered rates. Uh, so we're involving the public. Down the road, every five years, we have to create an integrated water management plan. Um, in the past, that document's been available at the library, and in my opinion, the board has done the bare minimum checklist of public involvement. I have stressed in conversations uh, with staff so far that this year I'd like to follow that workshop model and have some weekend events and go to different towns, including Mission Springs and Cathedral City, so that we involve people in the, the long-term range planning that, that really will affect all of us. So outreach is important in my mind, making ourselves available. Uh, we get a lot of response uh, uh, by email. People don't necessarily have to come to our meetings to give us that. Our email addresses are all on the uh, website and we're always available. Thank you much. And again to Richard Oberhaus for this question. And that is, we were all talking ahead that concerns are a little bit different within the district. Perhaps the uh, Cathedral City Cove and the Dream Homes area and downtown Palm Springs might have slightly different agendas. So to that end, the question is, uh, would you support election of board members by specific district within the DWA as opposed to the way everyone's elected now? Well, the, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. It's come up a couple times, and it's all in the details. I've got to remind you that even though we're 325 square miles and with 22,000 accounts, a third of our bills go out of district and out of state. <laughs> so I don't know if we should be electing board members in Canada or Michigan, but as far as a representative body that, that is serving the public, the vast majority of our customers are in Palm Springs. Mission Springs is our uh, retailer up there, and they elect their own board. And so it, for the time being, nobody's made a convincing argument to me that district elections make sense for this particular agency. Kristen Bloomer? Um, I would agree that I, I don't think district elections are necessary, but I would say that as a board member, I would make sure to have open communication with the residents of Desert Hot Springs and the Mission Springs Water District board members, as well as all the um, residents and business owners in Palm Springs in Cathedral City that are affected by Desert Water Agency and make sure that they're getting just as equal amount of communication and getting their voices heard as well as the uh, predominant area of Palm Springs. Greg Ewing. Thank you. The argument that we've heard at the board when people have brought this question to us is one of uh, equity and whether it is fair to have uh, at-large election, elections versus district elections. And thus far, there's not been any evidence that there's in any inequity in the current at-large system. And the thing that strikes me about the possibility of going to districts is the issue of Mission Springs and Desert Hot Springs, because Mission Springs voters also vote for the Desert Water Agency and yet they don't pay the rates that might be set by the Desert Water Agency Board. So I'm a little concerned about giving uh, district uh, uh, power, if you will, to a uh, group of voters that wouldn't be paying for the rates that they might be voting on. So the equity issue gets a little complicated when you start to see the boundary issues that Desert Water and Mission <laughs> Springs deal with. And absent any um, uh, demonstrated uh, inequities in the current at-large system, I, I think we're in better shape with at-large elections here. Okay, next question, and I'm going to uh, combine one with uh, also a, an audience uh, member here, and that is the, the state has mandated 36 percent cutbacks. Uh, can you kind of give us an assessment in your view of where we stand in this crisis? Is this a local crisis right now? And to that end, from the audience member, uh, with aquifer uh, declines uh, and also declines in the Colorado River uh, and how much water is uh, available there, where will future water come from? So just kind of give us an overall assessment of, um, we hear a lot of the skies falling, uh, is it? Craig Ewing. 
it is this year um, that we are facing the kinds of uh, uh, changes in climate that are leaving us uh, uncertain as to how the uh, old assumptions are going to work going forward. Uh, the old assumptions that we'll have a snowpack in the Sierras and that the Rocky Mountains will uh, carry water for us throughout the year and both of those will drain into the state project, uh, state water project and the Colorado River respectively. Um, but it's not going to stop raining, it's going to rain differently. And the question is, will we have the storage to respond to the uh, changes that we're going to see in the way rain falls and uh, water moves around the western United States? And the Desert Water Agency and the Coachella Valley generally are in a remarkably fortunate position to have the aquifer that we have. Uh, and we know that we've been recharging the aquifer since the 1970s after recognizing, as, as Richard mentioned earlier, that there was a recognition of overdraft in the 1940s when this valley was less than a tenth its size today. So the efforts over the years since that, uh, uh, since 70 years ago, to uh, uh, balance the aquifer and start to recharge the aquifer has been a, a significant part of, of the work of the Desert Water Agency and others. But looking forward, we have a, a number of things we need to do to protect the integrity of the aquifer. One is to continue to look to stabilize the larger distribution system from the Colorado and the State Water Project. Um, and the second thing is to look at conservation. Neither one of those alone is the answer. We have to stabilize the larger system, and we have to conserve and take less out of the aquifer in our use. Kristen Bloomer. Um, I agree with all of that, and um, definitely going forward, it's going to be a delicate balance of conservation and where our water supply is coming from to recharge the aquifer and replenish the water here to make sure that we are ready for the next drought that comes. Um, as a state water contractor and w the state water project, we haven't been getting our full allotment from the state water project. And there are projects online that haven't been done yet. Um, more storage south of the Delta and a tunnels project that needs to be completed and that will help prepare for the next drought so that we have more water stored um, when the snowpack and the rain is not um, where it should be or where it's better for us. So going forward, one of the main concerns is uh, leadership from the Desert Water Agency up in Sacramento to make sure that these projects get started and completed and also that we, um, you know, we're good stewards of the aquifer here and work with our, not only our, our residents and businesses and our, you know, top users in the Desert Water Agency to make sure that everyone is and help them to do their part of conservation. Richard Oros? Well, we're definitely in a new age. Um, you know, whether you believe climate change, the Pope, the governor, the president all say it's happening. I think the governor standing in no snowpack on April Fool's Day was no joke. It's for real. Last year, I took a five week sabbatical and drove up one side of the Rockies, made it up to Glacier National Park, turned around at the Canadian border, and came down the other side. Uh, the weather change is happening. Uh, the water system that uh, we have built in California is something that the Romans uh, were on the edge of doing and the Aztecs dreamed they had, wished they had. Uh, but we need to adapt and change and capture storm water. In Southern California, there's all kinds of innovative programs to reduce our reliance on imported water. Here in the desert, with five inches average rainfall, we're always going to need that imported water. We need to lobby and make sure we get our fair share. Keep in mind, we've been in there since the beginning of that project. So we need to lobby that the Twin Tunnels get built and improve the security and safety of the system. We need to lobby and make sure that we get what we pay for. And that means an experience, lobbying, being in Sacramento and communicating with those folks. But here on the home front, it means changing our water footprint. We've got to become more sustainable. 
and we've got to reduce our water usage. And you know, don't be scared about that. Phoenix, Scottsdale, name the cities in the desert that people move to and love the climate and the sunshine. The same thing that we have here. Somehow this green lush oasis that grew up in the 50s, well, it's time that we just get real and adapt to a more desert-friendly landscaping model. Okay, it's sticking with you again. Uh, will we be paying more for less? If your revenues are down 36% because of the state mandated cutbacks, uh, do you have thoughts on how the agency will be able to continue rates at current levels if revenues dramatically go down because of reduced usage, the cutbacks you're talking about? You're a reporter and you're nailing us on a, on a tough one. There's no question that there's fixed costs to running a water agency. Uh, we're a youthful water agency. We're not the city of New York or the city of Los Angeles with century old pipes blowing up and flooding UCLA, et cetera. Um, so we are blessed that right now our infrastructure uh, is a, of a younger age, but there's no question that asset and that investment is going to require maintenance, and that maintenance is going to cost money. Uh, and we've got to be honest about it. We're going to have to restructure our rates in some way and have a frank conversation, a very transparent conversation, uh, the kind of conversation that I think would take place in workshops uh, so that people can have some input. The, we are one of only two agencies in the Valley that does not have tiered rates. Uh, tiered rates are not the save all answer to everything. Uh, in Las Vegas, they have tiered rates and their number one customer is Sultan of Brunei. He uses 1.9 million gallons of water a day. He doesn't care what tier he's in. The other extreme is South Africa. Believe it or not, the first tier of water in, in the country of South Africa is free. There's a basic human right to water. So I think we need to be creative, learn from what tiered rates across the state have done here in our own valley and pick what fits best our community by having an honest dialogue. And I'm open to all thoughts on it. But to answer your question, there is no question that we are going to have to pay more for water in the future. But you won't say when. Uh, it's coming sooner rather than later. Okay. Kristen Bloomer. Okay. Um, I agree also that, um, you know, that Desert Water Agency, if you're selling less water and you're getting less income, you're going to have to make some adjustments. Um, the agency has done a very good job at uh, being fiscally responsible and has reserves and is able to, in the immediate future, um, cover those shortfalls. But we need to plan for the future and there will be a rate study done and make to make sure that we're charging the appropriate and affordable rate to all the ratepayers and that it is fair to everybody. Um, tiered rates is not an, a panacea, it doesn't solve all the problems. Um, and some people equate tiered rates with conservation. Um, Desert Water Agency has been able to conserve more than our neighbor um, at the east end of the valley and they have tiered rates. So as of right now, I do not believe that desert wa that tiered rates make sense for Desert Water Agency. They often are, are not fair for say the single mother with um, four children is going to end up paying more for their water than a single wealthy person. And I don't think that's right. Thanks. Greg Ewing. Thank you. Uh, this question, as I understand it, wasn't so much about tiered rates, but about the fiscal health of the agency. I hope we do talk about tiered rates uh, tonight. But the underlying structure we have with our rates is, 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 is a little out of whack. Uh, every operation has both fixed costs and variable costs. And for the Desert Water Agency, our fixed costs are the tanks, the testing, all the infrastructure that we maintain, whether we sell a gallon or a million gallons those fixed costs have to be paid. The variable costs are the energy that we spend pumping water. If we pump less water, we spend less energy. So this fixed and variable cost formula is not matched by our fixed and variable rates. Fixed rate is your base rate, the variable rate is your per unit charge. They're out of whack. 
And so when we sell less water, our variable revenue falls faster than our variable costs. And that's why we have uh, a deficit that we had to cover by borrowing $4 million from reserves this year. Well, that's not a sustainable fiscal model. And so there's going to have to be some adjustments in the rate structure so that we can align our, our fixed revenues with our fixed costs, our variable revenues, our variable costs, so that no matter how much water we sell or maybe conserve, we've got a fiscally sound agency. And we're going to have to work on that next year. Okay, so let's keep it right on that then and just go the other way and start with tiered rates and also penalizing water wasters, all these other ways of, um, you know, charging people who use the most, the most, and keeping everyone else flat. Cathedral City has the uh, unique situation of having both Desert Water Agency and Coachella Valley Water District customers, so they get to talk to each other about what it's like to operate or be charged by the two agencies. And we hear stories about the, uh, uh, the tiered rate and the penalty, the drought penalty scheme that has been adopted and imposed by Coachella Valley Water District. And boy, do we hear about it. Uh, and I think it is important, as uh, Kristen mention, mentioned, that as we look at the Desert Water Agency's conservation numbers over the last three or four months, they're tracking pretty closely with Coachella Valley Water District. So the pricing effect of tiered rates is not having a significantly different uh, uh, impact on conservation in CVWD as our single rate does in Desert Water Agency. We're conserving about the same. Now, my, so I want to watch before we leap too quickly into tiered rates as much as I conceptually agree with the idea. If Desert Water Agency customers start to hit conservation fatigue and our numbers start to fall and Coachella, Coachella Valley districts stay where they are, then uh, that tells me that tiered rates work and that our education efforts and our incentive efforts go so far and then people start to tune out. So that's sort of my litmus test going forward is how will the conservation efforts of the two agencies compare, because it's a great laboratory for this question of tiered rates versus a single rate, and if our conservation numbers track going forward month after month, then I'm perfectly content to leave tiered rates alone. It's very expensive, it's very complicated, and uh, if we don't have to impose the additional costs on our customers, I'm glad to not have to do that. Kristen Blumer? Um, uh, tiered rates versus uh, flat rates has been an argument for um, a while. And tiered you have to look at, especially since we're looking at the fiscal situation at the agency, that uh, imposing tiered rates has a very high punitive cost. Um, you most often need more staff. It costs more to go out and um, assess everybody's water budget and make sure and assess the, the different tiers. So that is an additional uh, cost to the agency. Um, also, uh, the conservation numbers are, they're not equating with the tiered rates and the fines. Um, almost everyone I talk to in the Coachella Valley Water District is being fined and there's a lot of frustration from the, I hear from the ratepayers in that district that they've done everything that the district has told them to do and they're still being fined. So I would hate for our ratepayers to have to go through that and um, be fined. We also have to make sure to look at the legality of tiered rates. Um, there's been a few rulings where agencies have imposed tiered rates and they've had to repeal them and repay all of the ratepayers um, you know, what they owe them based on the tiered rates being illegal. We cannot charge more for the water than what it costs to deliver to the ratepayers. So that's another um, item that you don't wanna have to get into litigation over moving to a tiered rate structure. So I feel for Desert Water Agency that um, the flat rates and not having um, fines for the um, over water usage is working fine. Richard Overhaus. I'm glad to be the last one speaking on this because uh, both Craig and Kristen have great points. But we entered into this drought 
with a toolbox that really had nothing in it. Uh, because of the 218 process and the lack of us investigating and doing the rate study on tiered rates uh, five years ago meant that we couldn't even put that on the table right now. So our hands were a little tied and we're really counting on voluntary conservation efforts. In going forward, I think it's very important that we look at a rate study that encompasses all kinds of options so that everything's on the table should we need it. That doesn't mean we implement tiered rates next year, but at least in the five-year window that that's something that we could consider. I'd also like to remind people that you know the small water user who's doing the 25-30% conservation and sees a neighbor wasting water, they feel like they're subsidizing the water waster. So there's a reverse side to that equation and I, I say it again, everything needs to be on the table. If we're gonna to go to the expense of doing a rate study in the next 12 months, six months, um, it's important for us to include that and have those numbers and that knowledge available to us. We can also learn from the mistakes of agencies statewide, some that got caught in lawsuits, other models work better than others, um, and how many tiers work all of that should be on the table, and I think we should have a frank conversation about it. One of the other big issues, and we've heard the uh, word lawsuits brought up a number of times, and we've heard tribal brought up a couple of times. Um, so let's get uh, all of your takes on the uh, legal challenges from the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians. Richard Oberhaus, what would you, would you do anything differently going forward? Well, if I was on the Agua Caliente, I would have never filed the lawsuit. But we live in a community, we share this territory with the Agua Caliente. Uh, we're all members of the community. We're gonna have to sort out the water dispute. And being a current board member, I really can't go into great detail because it's a legal matter. Uh, but I hope that we resolve that issue sooner rather than later. Can we say how much money we're willing to spend defending that lawsuit? I can't say that tonight. Kristen Blumer. Um, I believe that the water here belongs to everybody and that the ongoing lawsuit is in the federal courts and they're going to make their decisions on um, the, the different items that are there. I also, you know, I grew up with a lot of the tribal members. There are lots of our friends of mine and I think that I would have a um, great effort in sitting down and coming to the table with them and having a conversation with them, open up lines of communication and come up with a plan where it's good for everybody and it's good for the um, aquifer and the water resources that we all use here in the Coachella Valley and in the Desert Water Agency uh, borders, but I think uh, opening up the lines of communication between the DWA board and um, the tribal council is going to be the most important thing and will get the best and cheapest uh, results. Okay, Craig Ewing and perhaps a current board member would say that you tried. Well, we were sued so we, defend, we are defending our position in the lawsuit and our position is that the aquifer is a public resource which is its current status any one of us can put a well in the ground in our backyard and pump water. That's the public nature of this aquifer. No one has special rights. In fact, Desert Water Agency doesn't have the special rights to the water. We don't own the water. Um, what we have is the right to be the utility. So I could put a well in my backyard and pump my own water. What I'm not permitted to do is sell it to my neighbor. But this public resource, the tribe is saying they're first in line. They get the water before anybody else. And that's a total change to the nature of the aquifer. And it's a new assertion in water law nationwide. So we're defending this, Coachella Valley Water District and Desert Water Agency are defending this, but should this move through the courts and establish the, trites, uh, the tribe's first right, then we won't be the only ones at the table. Every pumper in the valley, uh, homeowners associations that have their own wells, um, golf courses, remote businesses that have their own wells, 
all of those will be pulled into what might end up being a full adjudication of how much everyone gets out of the aquifer. And my position on this is that the lawyers who settle that case haven't been born yet. It will take 40 to 50 years. So how much were we willing to spend? We're willing to spend each year enough to keep our position uh, strong in the courts, but we'll see what the courts do. And this could, make, this could end up with several visits to the Supreme Court before it's all said and done. Then a quick follow-up, and then we'll go uh, continue on. One of the issues the tribe brings up is water quality uh, coming from the Colorado River as opposed to the water that uh, runs okay. off from our local mountains. And also, um, in talking with tribal chairman Jeff Gruby, he felt that we have rights to that uh, uh, state water uh, that we swap out that is, it's better quality than the Colorado River water. So, is there anything to that part of the lawsuit? The only issue that the tribe has raised with regard to the quality of the Colorado River water is total dissolved solids. All other constituents, um, the, legal, uh, the, the technical language for water quality issues, all other constituents are well under state and federal standards. Total dissolved solids are basically salts. And there's no health issue associated with total dissolved solids. It's a taste and odor issue. And the federal standard is if you get to 1,000 parts per million, you're going to start to notice it. Colorado River is 600. The aquifer is about 400. That's the only water quality issue they've got. And it's not a water quality issue. So we're a little frustrated on our end to, to have the quality of the water from the Colorado River question when it is drunk by millions of people in Southern California. Uh, and it uh, provides us with fully compliant water under state and federal standards. Kristen Blumer. Um, the, the, uh, the water quality uh, difference um, doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, where we're very lucky here to where we don't have to treat our water nearly as much as if you were living in Los Angeles. And I, I think we can't not replenish the aquifer and there's no way for us to get state water project water here unless they um, complete a bunch of different projects to bring that water here so um, my solution would be i mean that's our only and best option and if we want to to continue to replenish the aquifer that's what we have to do richard Oberhaus. Pretty much been covered. Um, yes, we can extend the state water project. And if the tribe would like to pick up that price tag, I think it's about $2 billion to extend the pipeline to our backyard. So that's out there. Um, but the Colorado River water not only serves 30 million people in Southern California, but all kinds of people in Arizona and Las Vegas. That water is good quality, is drinkable, and certainly meets all the standards it is more tested and it meets a higher standard than that bottled water sitting on the table in front of you, sir. Richard Auberhaus, uh, moving on to the next question. Why do we continue to build new homes, hotels, uh, golf, well, we haven't built golf courses in a long time here in the desert, uh, when we're in this uh, drought right now? Is there any point where you would support a moratorium on building? Um, until some of these other questions are answered about rates and those sorts of issues? Well, serving on the water board, I don't think I have the authority to stop development. We can put a halt in a stage five uh, drought emergency as far as hooking up any new water supplies. But that, that's a, a, a planning decision that planning is made by city councils. Um, we have a tourist-based economy in Palm Springs. It doesn't show up in our per capita numbers, but those are low flush toilets. Um, you've seen the Las Vegas model. You can have an awful lot of tourists that use a lot less water than a homeowner. So I'm not worried about our tourism economy, I'm not willing to shut it down. Uh, I'm worried about uh, getting through this drought and preparing for the next one. Kristen Bloor. Yes, I believe that the Desert Water Agency needs to have open communication with all the um, cities involved and be in, 
um, constant contact with development and make sure that everyone's on the same page is that there is enough water supply for the um, plan development into the future because we don't want someone to build a house and move in and then all of a sudden they turn on their tap and they don't have any water. So I think it's just keeping a close eye on that and working together with the city planners and city developers and, and making sure that everyone um, is aware of the water supply and how far into the future it will go. Greg Ewing? Two things come to mind. One is that all of the development that we see and will see for a few years, maybe several years going forward, are already contained within city and county general plans. And the water agencies reviewed those general plans to determine that the full build out of these cities could be adequately supplied with water. So the new development that we see has already been planned for with regard to water supply. The second thing that I want to note is that new development is far more water efficient than our existing homes. I live in a 50 year old home. I've got more to do to become water efficient than someone who buys a brand new home that meets the latest efficiency requirements, has no lawn in the landscaping based on the latest irrigation and, and landscape standards from the state. So new development has built in water conservation. Our real work is in existing development where we've got so much transition to get through. Here's a question from an audience member. Why aren't prices for water statewide price regulated? In other words, why aren't we on a, a statewide rate structure? Uh, because there are 480 water agencies, each with their own uh, story to tell about how they supply water. In my work up in Sacramento with Aqua, I've talked to water agencies in the Sierra Nevadas that are delivering water to their customers in wooden flumes built by the 49ers, uh, whereas in Los Angeles, they're injecting recycled water into the ground to create a curtain uh, to prevent saltwater intrusion from getting into the aquifer in, in LA. So there are so many different uh, ways that water is supplied, treated, moved, stored, that one rate won't work. Uh, in fact, we do have a price control, however, in the state constitution that says that an agency cannot charge more for the service of delivering water than it costs to deliver water. We can't be an oil company and price gas to whatever the market will bear, which is why water is so inexpensive in the Coachella Valley is because our business model is, uh, requires no treatment and we're our own state contractor, so we don't pay middleman expenses. And we can't charge more than that. And every agency has a different uh, uh, set of circumstances, and so there's going to be a different rate. Kristen Blumer? Um, I think a statewide uh, water rate would definitely um, be more than what every Coachella Valley resident is paying now, so it wouldn't benefit us here as uh, ratepayers in the Coachella Valley. And, you know, everyone has different access to water, and I think Desert Water Agency has done a good job in being fiscally responsible about, and legally responsible about following the state constitution and charging only what it costs to get the water to our customers and that will continue to be the um, you know, procedure that happens. And if, you know, as a, as a board member, I would make sure that all those um, items are followed. Richard Overhouse. It's very obvious that uh, the cost of water varies. If you're living in San Francisco, you're, you're paying for new tunnels from Hetch Hetchy, you're updating water lines that are century old. The cost structure is very different. We're a nonprofit. We're governed by the state constitution. We can only charge what it costs. We're blessed that our costs are low. And we don't have a lot of those problems to contend with. We don't even have the Chrome 6 problem uh, that other Valley cities have. Um, subsidizing uh, other places because our water is cheap doesn't seem fair to local residents here. I'll stick with the current system with and what the state constitution provides for. Okay, sticking with you, would you support building codes that would require residential gray water recycling and new construction and some remodeling projects? That's a loaded question. We recycle every drop of water in Palm Springs. So whether you flush it down the toilet or you use the gray water in your yard, it's getting recycled. Um, 
if you carry the bucket from your shower to water or shrub like I do right now, or when you flush it, it ends up on the high school football field, the water is getting recycled. Uh, the expense to uh, do waste water, gray water re recycling in every household, I think that's a personal choice up to the builder, the homeowner, and I'd leave it up to them. Kristen Bloomer? Um, I actually just talked to a developer who's going to build a track of who wants to build a track of homes up in uh, Desert Hot Springs, and there is a company that provides your own uh, gray water system uh, to do your own gray water. You know, use your recycle your indoor water, and you can use it for your outdoor uh, watering. Um, there is an extra cost involved in that, and even he wasn't sure if it would all. Uh, pencil out, but if you stay in the home for a certain number of years, it looked like it would work. I don't think changing the building codes would um, be beneficial. I think that would uh, definitely, we'd see a decrease in building permits um, because it is an extra cost for that developer up front um, to put that type of system in. I do believe that developers, there's going to be more of a balance of what type of um, landscaping and things that they can use within these new developments. And I think that's where um, city councils and planners need to look at that when these new developments come on board, that they are um, putting in drought tolerant landscape plans. Greg Ewing? The building code in the state of California already has provisions for gray water systems, but they are voluntary that if you want a gray water system, the state has standards by which you must follow. And there's, no, there's been no great rush by people to do that in their homes for a number of reasons. One, it's expensive. You, not every uh, source of water in your home is gray water. Uh, toilets and washing machines are considered black water and cannot be put into a gray water system. So you have to replumb your house before you can even put in a gray water system, and then you have to be the expert managing it. This is why people haven't rushed to do that. It makes no sense for me to now to, to consider it as a mandate. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, and we'll go on to some, uh, give you a chance to do a closing statement. Uh, this final question is, let's see. Um, what do you see as the agency's responsibility regarding the salt and sea, which has been widely projected to become an environmental disaster sometime shortly after 2017. Well, the Salton Sea, as most of you know, is subject to the Quantification Settlement Agreement, which was the sale of water by the IID and many farmers to San Diego. But by those farmers selling their water rather than using it for irrigation, it's reduced the amount of water that will flow into the Salton Sea. The sea dries and exposes a bed that, uh, a dry bed that could create some severe air quality issues. The Desert Water Agency has no agricultural accounts. And at the north end of the valley, we don't have uh, a direct involvement. But we do participate with Coachella Valley Water District, which is directly involved in the QSA, uh, and the other three agencies in the, in the Coachella Valley in common planning, common coordination of, of effort. So we will stand with our fellow uh, Coachella Valley Water Agencies and support them in uh, the efforts to make sure that the Salton Sea is successfully mitigated as the QSA goes forward. Kristen Bloomer? Um, I believe that this, the Salton Sea is, you know, is obviously an ongoing problem going forward, and um, communication and working together with all the agencies in the Valley to work towards a common good so that, the, that we can, you know, move forward together. Um, regarding the Salton Sea is going to be very important and make sure that Desert Water Agency does have a seat at the table when they are discussing any um, uh, mitigation or different items that are going to be happening at the Salton Sea that will affect our um, Desert Water Agency customers. Richard Oberhaus? This is a really valley, valley wide, broad issue, um, not, not a Desert Water Agency issue. Uh, it's the biggest urban to water, ag to urban water transfer ever. Um, there's been well over a decade of talking. Uh, th that time frame was to come up with a solution. 
we are all going to have to, as a community, every agency, city council, every resident, scream a little louder and make sure that people keep their word, that they mitigate what is going to be a disaster. On that note, uh, Richard Overhaus, and then we'll go in reverse order, and each just take a couple of minutes and tell us uh, why um, you're the top candidate and touch on any issues that you feel perhaps we should have touched on and we didn't uh, over the last hour. First, I'd like to thank you for sponsoring this and everybody coming this evening. Water is an important topic. It seems to be on the back burner this year, uh, but I appreciate your attendance. It is the most important issue going forward for desert community. And it takes experience, it takes leadership, uh, and a vision. And I think I possess all of that and have earned in the past two years the support of voters to reelect me and continue us on our mission of sustainability, lowering our water footprint, keeping the agency in sound fiscal order, and making sure that there's plentiful, affordable water for all. Thank you much, Kristen Bloomer. I too would like to thank everybody for coming tonight and for the Cathedral City Evening Rotary for sponsoring this event. And I believe, I hope that you've um, found confidence in me to vote for me and vote for some new leadership on the board to um, fight in Sacramento for our um, water supply. So we have a plentiful water supply going forward and that we will be um, fiscally responsible to um, protect the fiscal foundation that the Desert Water Agency has and move forward into the future. And also um, support my want to open lines of communication with the different agencies and all the residents of the Desert Water Agency um, area to make sure that everyone is getting affordable, uh, reliable, and healthful water now and long into the future. And Craig Ewing. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight and to the Cathedral City Evening Rotarians. Uh, if you think about your utilities, cable, telephone, power, natural gas, and water, water is the big capital pro project of all. It's heavy, it's big, it's expensive to move, you can string a few wires and provide a lot of those services, but you've got to put enormous pipes in the ground. It's a very capital intensive, uh, technical world to work in. And it's been a fascinating experience for me over the last eight years being on the board to learn about this and learn how to do it well as I believe the Desert Water Agency is a model agency for delivering water to our customers. But there's a new day that has been brought to us in, in, with an exclamation point by this drought that we need to move out of the shadows and move into a public partnership with our customers on water use and water supply. And I've been a part of that change and I want to continue to do that. I, bring, I believe I bring a wealth of experience and would seek your votes that I might spend another term on the board of directors. Thank you to the candidates. Thank you for everyone who uh, is here tonight. And thank you, Cathedral City Evening Rotary. And uh, another shameless plug, uh, cast your vote and then watch it count on KESQ and KESQ.com. <laughs>